Okay, so thank you, first of all, very much for your presentation. Um, to now try to deepen the discussion on the jobs versus environment dilemma, um, particularly in the automotive industry, we will first... Oh, that doesn't work. Um, we will first take a step back and reconsider the motivations for this uh, line of research. Then we will briefly summarize the paper again um, before pointing out the originality of uh, the research and uh, also some gaps and open questions. Maybe someone of you can do the changing for me. Um, so to begin, we brought two graphs to again illustrate the importance of studying the potential transformations of the automotive industry. So in uh, this pie chart, uh, you can see that the transport sector um, plays a key part in the EU's greenhouse gas emissions, as we have just heard, um, making up uh, more than 21% of all emissions, and that doesn't even include international shipping and aviation. Um, and in the second graph, you can see that um, in the EU, transport is the only sector where greenhouse gas emissions have not decreased in the past uh, 30 years, as you can see on the left axis, where it's the only um, positive uh, absolute change. Um, so just looking at these two visualizations alone, it becomes quite clear that something needs to change in the transport sector. Um, and while behavioral changes on the side of the consumers are undoubtedly important to some degree, um, the authors of this paper yeah, highlight um, the centrality of really rethinking the production and supply of cars, which implies, uh, this is a quote from the paper, um, a reduction in the production of passenger cars and also a conversion of the automotive industry towards alternative production lines. Um, but of course, this strategy provokes conflicts and resistance, at least whenever uh, economies rely on the production of passenger cars, which is the, the, uh, the case in Austria. So before specifically diving into the findings of the paper, uh, we first wanted to point out how it is kind of situated in the broader literature. Um, and generally speaking, it's embedded in a tradition of research that really analyzes the role of workers and their representatives um, in socio-ecological transformations. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize um, the understanding of the word transformation, how it is used here, because it really refers to, and this is another quote from the paper, um, more radical, systemic and non-linear changes in shape and form that alter societal characteristics with regard to economic structures, political institutions, material and energy flows, and sociocultural practices. Um, so this understanding of transformations really goes beyond incremental and technological uh, changes, such as, for example, a switch from uh, combustion engines to electric cars. And instead, they really propose a more fundamental system change um, that, un that challenges the power relations that underlie the, um, the fossil-fueled political economy of cars, so to say. Um, this then gives rise to um, a, some different types of changes in the mobility sector that we could imagine. Um, no, it's the slide before, sorry. Um, so we could imagine there to be a simple shift in the propulsion technology of cars. Um, but also a bit more, going a bit further, uh, we could change traffic patterns uh, towards public transport. Or finally, we could radically transform uh, our material and discursive mobility patterns. And it's really only this third type of change in the mobility sector um, that does question the capitalist relations of power that underpin uh, the so-called car hegemony. Um, so I would assume that most of us would agree that we need this third type of change in the transport sector. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but as we have just heard in the in the presentation, the large problem with that is that so many employees uh, work in the uh, in the corresponding industries, which provokes potential tensions between employment conservation and environmental policies, which is captured in the term of the jobs versus environment dilemma. Um, and again, we have brought a quote from the paper that really summarizes this concept very well. It reads, generally in favor of decarbonization, trade unions often face internal tensions and conflicts arising from concerns over job losses in the traditionally unionized fossil-based industries that social ecological transformations imply. Um, and then this idea is what gives rise to the necessity of the so-called just transition, so the, the aim to involve workers and their uh, representatives in the transformation. However, what we observe is that trade union strategies often remain quite defensive uh, in the face of um, the transformations that are before us. Um, and in line with that, we can look at a typology of two different trade union strategies, where on the one hand, um, so-called business unions really just try to safeguard current production and employment levels, mainly through uh, technical improvements. Um, and on the other hand, social unions try to incorporate uh, the community and ecological interrelations of workers. Um, and criticize this productivist view of ecological modernization. And it is then this second type of union strategies that is more in line with what the literature calls working class environmentalism. Um, we will keep the summary of the paper very short to allow for more time for the uh, discussion. So, but maybe for a general introduction, uh, we have already heard the aim of the paper was um, to identify potentials and barriers um, for the social ecological transformation of specifically the Austrian automotive industry from a labor perspective. And to do so, they draw on uh, cultural political economy scholarship and try to um, connect the materiality of the Austrian automotive industry with the views of the workers who are employed there. Um, and they do so on the basis of 27 interviews, if I remember correctly, that they uh, conducted with representatives from trade unions, work councils, but also uh, from the firms themselves. Um, I will not bore you with going through the characteristics of the sector again, because we uh, just heard about that. Um, I think the important thing to take away from the workers' crisis construals um, that are based on the qualitative data is really that the dominant narratives, so the improvement and also the diversification imaginary, they um, perpetuate this incremental understanding of uh, the transformation or the crisis more generally. And then finally, um, I will also not go through the entry points again, but I want to point out that uh, you should keep in mind the first entry point that we put here. So the idea that workers' skills and um, expertise may allow them to produce alternatives to cars to safeguard their employment, because we will come back to that later in the discussion. Okay, uh, so we've covered more of the, uh, the background and the structure of the paper, and I'm going to fo focus a little bit more on the contributions to the literature and some of the original ideas that have come out that we really appreciate. Um, so we picked out three main uh, contributions to lit literature. So as we mentioned before, there's been a lack of um, consideration of workers and trade unions at the core of this debate, and they're still rarely mentioned uh, within these uh, debates over the socio-ecological tra transformations. And then we also really appreciate uh, moving beyond the uh, jobs versus growth debate, because this is often uh, considered a dichotomous choice with the social relations of production, consumption, and the outputs. Are, they're rarely questioned. And there's the need to overcome this conflict between the two uh, positions with a movement of cooperation and empowerment of labor. 
And then a third thing that we pointed out that we really liked um, from a literature perspective was to take the Austrian case study. Um, so it has some really quite interesting features. It's a growth, uh, growth industry and accounts for over 10% of uh, Austria's industrial employment. It has high levels of R&D spending and high levels of um, high skilled workers, but it still maintains this subordinate position within the, uh, within the global value chain. So it's really a component producer for the um, original equipment manufacturers in Germany and in France. So this is a really interesting case. And so to a few more points of originality, Again, the centrality of uh, works and trade unions as key actors. But here we, we like the acknowledgement that, um, that workers are not individually at fault for the uh, potentially damaging production that they're engaged in, but they do have the opportunity to become um, agents of change in influencing the, the transformation. And particularly, this is through the, uh, the channel of organized labor and through the trade union movement. On the flip side, they also have the power to entrench the status quo. Um, so as we've seen with the dominant improvement imaginary, um, there is not as much consideration of a structural change as maybe we would like to see. Um, we also really appreciate the consideration of technological lock-in and how this has affected um, the genesis of the automotive sector. So it really considers the strong path dependency uh, from both an economic and technological point of view. Um, and this is interesting because historically, technological trajectories are broadly pollution intensive. And this, in a way, acts as a barrier to more um, environmentally conscious innovation and the moving away from combustion. Um, we also uh, appreciate this because the, there's been a de-radicalization of the en energy transition discourse. It's moved into the mainstream, um, mainstream political debate. And the effect of this is that alternative technologies are having to compete um, with the remaining carbon lock-in technologies uh, rather than replacing them and this suffers at the moment from a lack of consensus about the best way to do this. And um, yeah, the, the, less, the less specialized in the inter internal combustion engine technologies, the more likely workers are to imagine um, a diverse range of uh, opportunities and uh, different paths for the future. And also just a quick point, um, on the value of incorporating qualitative research into economics. And I know this paper comes from more of a uh, so -so, um, sociological perspective, um, but it's important to acknowledge the historical neglect of qualitative studies within economics compared to the quantitative work. And what we've seen, particularly from the quotes before, is that qualitative research can really highlight the actual perspectives of uh, the, the economic actors who are involved in this process um, so we can really have a, an idea rather than relying on some sort of average worker position that you might find in a quantitative paper. Um, and this can also help us understand uh, the range of views, the diversity of views, as well as the potential directions for future change. Um, now we're going to move on to some some criticism, but also places where we could see the paper uh, develop in the future. Um, so one of the main things we pointed out was the potential that we are overlooking the heterogeneity of workers. Um, so the fact that the, uh, the interviews were largely carried, carried out with trade union representatives and worker council representatives perhaps conceal some of the nuances in perceptions um, of workers related to the transformation. For example, if we take op occupation, there would likely uh, be very stark differences between managers and workers, blue and white collar workers, full time and contract, skilled and unskilled. Uh, we think this might be a value, valuable direction to go in future. 
Um, related to this, uh, and this is a point we can mention in the discussion, um, what about the in intersectional perspectives? And through the trade union movement, what is the potential for entrenching existing inequalities that exist? Trade unions historically um, were built on broadly male manual labor and were quite exclusionary in their approaches. Um, but the trade unions themselves also risk alienating their core members if, uh, if ambitious climate goals are targeted. Um, and also the, the point of worker agency um, within the ecological transition, we've seen that although there's been a growth in um, greener automotive and energy sectors, these have been slower to unionize. And so within the ex existing labor power structures, they may not have the voice. And this is potentially exacerbated by the powerful role of the incumbent firms and the incumbent unions who, um, who may just uh, perpetuate the, the path of industrial development. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about three further points here and uh, which we find interesting to consider while we are uh, discussing the issue of uh, approaches of workers uh, towards the transition or transformation in the automotive industry. And then uh, we are, I'm going to ask some open questions in order to prompt the discussion. So one of the points is that like the economic and political power of the global automotive industry is very um, an important issue that we should uh, consider while we are we are talking about the agency of workers and trade um, labor unions within the transition process. So, <clears throat> yeah, we can. So, like the annual uh, revenue of the automotive industry is 2.75 trillion trillion euros, which uh, approximately makes the 3.65 per percent of the global GDP. And other than that, this industry is also very influential uh, in the political terms, like in the political sense, as we have already seen in our first joint seminar that uh, the industry is uh, very influential in using their lobbying, lobbying efforts in, and uh, like putting elder pressure on the uh, governments and ch like changing or influencing their uh, implementations and these implementations are mainly trade negotiations, environmental regulations, infrastructure investments and stand standards on production and like each of the points uh, the industry is very powerful or influential uh, to intervene with uh, decision making processes of either governments or intergovernmental or organizations and uh, they are most of the time successful to uh, get what they want and um, <clears throat> oh, okay. so yeah as a result of that it is important to think that and it's so important to think the agency of uh, labor unions and here uh, we ask the question of uh, given this enormous political influence what power do workers and trade unions really have to shape production processes and yeah, as you see here, it's the share of the GDP of uh, automotive industry in the uh, total like global GDP. And yeah, another point is the global value chains of the automotive industry. Yeah, global value chains in the automotive industry is very complex and uh, it can be either organized regionally or globally depending on the type of the production. And here, for, for example, for heavy and model specific parts, production is mo mostly organized regionally in order to ensure that uh, the product reaches to the final destination on time. But on the other hand, while the produ product is lighter and more generic parts, uh, it's organized more globally in order to take advantage of the uh, economies of scale and uh, cheap labor. And uh, when it's the more sophisticated part of the production, such as uh, designing the vehicles or de developing the vehicles, it's most of the time like uh, several places, which are mo like mostly in uh, core countries. And uh, this 
complex uh, global value chain means that there are uh, diversified types of terms within this global uh, uh, value chain and uh, like this basically uh, affects the approach of the workers because uh, probably like de depending on their uh, roles and where they are working within this global value chain, their approach towards this transformation could change because they are experiencing uh, different uh, things in their uh, work environment. And also here we ask the question of uh, can we expect the workers of automotive industry in other regions with different work contexts to have a more positive approach towards the transformation. And uh, yeah, uh, within this uh, global value chain, uh, Austrian car industry has a particular position that uh, it neither represents uh, big industry uh, companies nor uh, these uh, southern countries uh, because like Austria manufactures high-end high components with uh, high-skilled labors, but at the same time most firms in Austria are suppliers to the uh, original equipment manufacturers. Uh, so which means that actually it uh, has the features of both uh, like core and periphery countries at the same time. And as a result of that, like the uh, strategies we propose for Austria would be uh, not applicable, applicable to other countries uh, because like the context will be uh, very different. And here like two questions arise as well. Uh, given the particular positionality of Austria in this industry, are these findings even generalizable? And uh, what is the potential and value of qualitative research of the socio-ecological transformation? And, uh, no, it's not. No, it's not? Yeah, more, yeah. So the third point is the unequal development in the automotive industry. So, uh, yeah, transnational automotive companies relocate their uh, operations to the low cost areas most, uh, most of the time in order to uh, like minimize the cost of the production. And uh, bec like a global value chain on automotive industry generates unequal economic relations between uh, core and periphery countries as a result, and it perpetuates existing underdeveloped structure of the peripheries. So, um, here. so here, like the companies from uh, core, co core countries basically benefiting the cheap labor in the periphery and uh, in return they do not, uh, they do not contribute to the long-term development of the uh, host countries and uh, other than that, the, co the host countries are mostly uh, stay dependent on the uh, imports uh, like technological skill and uh, capital imports coming from the core countries and uh, their uh, underdeveloped situation uh, mostly persists. And this is also an uh, important point that we should consider while we are talking about automotive industry because uh, it is one of the features of the industry that the unequal developments or unequal trade relations are very obvious, uh, like considering other uh, industries. And um, yeah, the questions we ask here is that is power completely concentrated in the firms from core countries and uh, do firms from semi-periphery and periphery countries have any voice on the trajectory of the industry? And also, as you can see here, uh, like on the on the fourth line, we can see that the uh, foreign investment most of the time uh, flows from uh, core countries to the periphery countries, and also uh, like the firms in the uh, top global top 100 list uh, are basically not existing from periphery countries, but uh, mostly core countries, and it's yeah, it's clearly shows that there is a very unequal relationship in the uh, trade. And yeah, but, like it's uh, important to consider this. It's important to consider this while we are talking about the approach of workers 
uh, towards the transpo transformation in the industry because, um, yeah, depending on the uh, context where the workers are uh, working, like whether it's in the core, core country or in the periphery country, uh, their approaches would be very different. And like in the further, re further research, uh, it would be interesting to consider this as well. <clears throat> and I'm here I'm going to give an example of ecologically unequal exchange. It's uh, the catalytic converters which are uh, started to be installed uh, to cars in 1970s as a result, uh, as a result of the uh, increasing uh, usage of the or increasingly protective environmental laws. And these catalytic converters basically um, uh, reduced emissions of hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxide uh, up to 90%. 90% compared to the 1970 levels. And the mechanism basically depends on the chemical, uh, chemical properties of platinum group metals, uh, which are main, mainly extracted in South Africa and Russia. And like the technology does not benefit every people equally because while uh, this, while like the uh, mining of the platinum is very uh, harmful for the environment that it affected the host uh, like or um, the people who were living around the minings a lot in terms like environmentally uh, they it's uh, basically contaminated the air uh, the rivers and the soil and at the same time it's uh, made people to leave their farms and uh, make them uh, deprived of their uh, livings and another example is the uh, Lucas plan. And uh, it's basically the Lucas, um, uh, yeah, the Lucas uh, uh, Aerospace uh, Company. And they, uh, the workers of the Lucas Aerospace Company, um, started to struggle to transform their uh, production into another uh, sector because. Uh, it was announced that thousands of uh, positions and skilled labor positions will be fired uh, because of the uh, technological improvements and uh, international competition. And uh, they just started to do a, a democratically led uh, like brainstorming process in order to find alternative goods for uh, their uh, factory and they came up with 150 different uh, alternative ideas of production and they uh, presented it to the management uh, in order to keep their jobs and in order to turn the um, trajectory of the company into somewhere else. And these products were mainly uh, visionary products which are wind turbines, hybrid cars, uh, heat pumps and energy efficient houses. Uh, but at the end, the management did not accept the offer because they just wanted to remain with the aerospace uh, sector, uh, even if it is uh, like in the declining process. And like this example is very uh, similar with the one that we saw in the previous uh, presentation about the fi fire engines. And uh, here we also ask the question of would a similar initiative be successful in the current political and economic landscape? And yeah. That's it. Yeah, thank you for your listening. <laughs> okay, then maybe you can come back here so yeah. provide some, of, some answers before we ask other questions. That I just react to, or what is? The, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, I think that's actually 
all of this uh, criticism is very valid. Uh, I think I, yeah, I try to say something to, to most of the points. Uh, and I start with um, the limitations of the research uh, design, basically, which is completely true. So we <laughs> are well aware that the focus on work council members does not represent uh, the heterogeneity of uh, the workers. I mean, it's, uh, it was, um, we did this um, a study actually together, or we developed uh, the project together with uh, the Austrian Chamber of Labor, which is kind of a, a specific organization in the Austrian context. So you have the Chamber of Labor and the Chamber of uh, Economy, actually. So these are, so everyone that is a worker in Austria is a member of the Chamber of Labor and everyone uh, that is uh, not a worker is a, a member of the Chamber of uh, Economy. And so we did this together with them. Uh, so we developed the, the research together with them and then it, we, it was just, uh, we could only do uh, a limited uh, amount of interviews, so we thought it would, best, it would be best to start with uh, work council members, because they kind of, I mean, the idea basically is that they represent uh, the workers in uh, the respective mm -hmm. companies, but of course these are the ones that are <coughs> they are, you, I mean, they are, um, or you can say, I mean, basically they are more close to uh, social democracy <laughs> than <laughs> all the other uh, workers. Basically, that's uh, the point I think that you can uh, very validly uh, make. I mean, there are, I don't know if you've, um, uh, in the, in the, um, Lab in labor sociology, especially in Germany, there is uh, uh, an interesting uh, tradition to do similar uh, studies, especially uh, Klaus Dörbe, for example, uh, at the University of uh, Jena. They do very interesting studies, really trying to grasp the heterogeneity of uh, workers in certain industries. And obviously then you have to deal with a lot with much more complexity, uh, a lot of right-wing uh, <laughs> organization uh, actually in uh, the workforce that we can't, we do not really, um, that is not really represented in this uh, study. So we are well aware of this limitation. Mm. Another uh, aspect that I took from your presentation is the question of agency. Uh, so do workers actually have uh, agency in, I mean, in, in Austria, but also with regard to the, the kind of global power of, and also the not only power, but the structure of the automotive industry <coughs> being very much um, just in time production scattered around uh, global value chains. And obviously, I mean, this is not, I mean, this agency is obviously very, very limited. <laughs> and we are well aware of this. So I would say that the, the intention of the research is more kind of a first, uh, a research intervention, <laughs> in a way, <laughs> to say that uh, it's important to look at these um, at these sectors, at these actors that are important, although their agency is at the moment very limited. So I think that's the one thing. And the other thing that is also, uh, that was also kind of, int the intention is more um, kind of an, uh, a movement intervention. So what we tried to do uh, with the research was also to um, try to better link the environmental movement uh, in Austria with the labor movement uh, in Austria. And this was also a way to, 
to approach uh, the uh, the chamber of labor and say well what would be what do you think would be important uh, questions uh, to raise how can we try to um, to kind of also remove barriers <laughs> that exist in the movements so there is historically i mean i guess that's the case in a lot of uh, countries because historically in most of the environmental conflicts um, unions stood on the other side <laughs> so that's basically what happens and we try to intervene a little bit also in this uh, conflict which um, I don't know, I wouldn't say that it was uh, particularly successful, but I think it's a start. And there, based on the project, there are also n now more initiatives um, um, where, yeah, where these linkages are, where different uh, people try to foster these linkages. Um, yeah, so I think that's, um, the, yeah, and then also um, with regard to agency, as I said, uh, I do not think that uh, workers have very specific <laughs> agency at the moment to, to really transform something in the industry, but I think what is important that we can look at a specific moments uh, in history or conflicts that emerge and that is for example when there are occasions uh, that for example companies uh, want to shut down um, uh, certain factories or they uh, want to um, outsource production to somewhere else I think these are interesting moments to think about what might be alternatives and who, um, who could be responsible in such moments so that, that because obviously, of course, uh, companies always threaten to outsource production uh, <laughs> towards um, Global South uh, country in countries in, um, in Austria or in Europe, I think, especially to uh, Eastern European countries. But that also comes with the risk uh, for companies. <laughs> so it's not that uh, they necessarily want to do this because uh, it's also important for companies to rely on skilled, that they can rely on skilled uh, labor, that they can uh, rely on certain um, research and technology um, uh, environments for their for their production so i think in these contexts it's interesting to then to have kind of the the to know that there can be agency and that it's not only like workers are passive um, victims of global developments that just um, evolve all that over them okay yeah I, maybe just a, a, a final a word on uh, would something like the Lucas plan be possible uh, today I mean actually it failed also then <laughs> that's actually important to say I think so um, I I do not think that it's so I do not see at the moment that there is very much, that it's very likely that workers in specific companies come up with, with certain plans that, that are then implemented uh, in a transformative way. I do not see this actually. But I think this combination of thinking about um, more about more coordinated 
political decisions on the national levels or on the EU level together with developments on the company level. That I think uh, would would be important. So not to so to also to interlink these levels and see well there are ideas on the company level, but we have to kind of um, agree on certain transformation pathways where we cannot say all the time well it's just we let the market decide on <laughs> what it will do uh, because that's obviously not really going to to work. Okay. Hello, my name is Dario. And because I'm Italian, I actually I was surprised by this idea of workers and unions uh, trusting or like um, agreeing and asking for political intervention. In Italy, often there's a very high lack of trust in the ability of planning. Mm -hmm. Okay. But also related to this, I was very curious about Dario. this idea of. Uh, we have different types of transformation, and uh, it's very interesting the, the aspect of the ability of workers to, to think about how the, uh, their industry can evolve, and they have definitely, they can have original ideas. But also, you um, underlined the importance of uh, downscaling. Next to transforming uh, the production, downscaling, downscaling it in some, certain, some sense, and I wanted to know if what, what is what was the feeling of workers' union of workers' representatives in this case about this being next to the fact that for sure there is an internal transformation without mm -hmm. uh, dismantling completely, but also to the possibility that the, there's going to be less demand or there should be less demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot for this. I think that's uh, the, the first point, especially, is an, is an interesting observation. And that's actually quite uh, typical for the Austrian case, because it's very much, uh, it, there is no autonomous uh, union movement <laughs> in Austria. That's just the case. I mean, it's, there are very much uh, representative uh, unions that where you have this kind of historically evolved uh, social partnership, so corporatism uh, mainly, so where uh, the, the unions together with the business um, representatives uh, together decide on uh, what's best uh, for, for, for the workers. So there is no kind of no militant uh, labor movement in this sense. So yeah, that, that also, I think that's an interesting observation. It also des uh, describes why <coughs> some of the, um, yeah, that also describes some of the quotes, I think. And the second point is, is a difficult one. So on like, what is their idea on downscaling? Uh, the industry. I mean, basically, we didn't ask them about, uh, do you think that it's a good idea to downscale uh, the industry? Because we wanted to hear their perspective. So we basically asked them, what do you think, uh, what will the industry look like uh, in 2050? So what is your perspective? Uh, what do you think uh, is going to change? We wouldn't, we didn't want to, to say. Well, I think uh, it's necessary to radically uh, reduce car production. What do you think about this idea? So that was not our our approach. And as uh, I said, this also didn't did only very rarely come up. Uh, by themselves. So we wanted to see if this actually comes up, if they kind of know or if they think this is a, a, a necessary step in a way uh, to in the transformation. So this is not necessarily the case, but what we, mm, what from the 
from the, the limited uh, sample that we had, they were not, all of them agreed that it's a huge challenge, we have to deal with climate change. So, which is also something good, no? Because, I mean, <laughs> that's uh, something good that you can build on, because uh, no one said, well, actually, uh, we do not have a problem, uh, just, uh, we just do business as usual. That's not what they said, but they said, well, there is a huge problem, but actually we think there is still a lot of um, possibilities in the improvement of existing uh, technologies, for example. So reduction was not really something that they, they envisioned, but as I said, I think I mean, we had, obviously this depended also very much on the, the kind of companies because there were ones we had interviews with Opel, uh, for example, I mean, the, the, they are in constant crisis, they shut down uh, one uh, factory after the other. These people said, well, I mean, we don't care what we produce. We just want to keep our jobs. Uh, we, I mean, they literally said, I should have brought the, the quote, they literally said, we would produce uh, Coca-Cola cans. We don't care. <laughs> we would like to uh, keep our jobs and we would like to have a, a secure, um, a secure workplace uh, and I think that's so they know obviously that the, the industry is in crisis um, in a way, yeah? so, so the question I think is basically if they think well uh, should we do something completely different uh, or is there as I said is there a possibility to transform from within so that everyone now produces um, electronic cars for example uh, then that's a huge uh, push Great. Um. Yes, uh, I'm Vitaria from Brazil, and my question is regarding also this uh, role of global chains of production within the automotive industry, which you've already touched a bit on. But it's mostly regarding the tendency that we see currently of uh, countries increasingly questioning the role of global chains of production and perhaps looking at reshoring or nearshoring mm -hmm. as a new strategy, mm -hmm. which I believe in this context would perhaps be a, a pathway for workers to have greater ag agency, mm -hmm. not only as to transform production such as that of the automotive industry, but also to cater production more towards local needs and to the environmental conditions we're facing. My question then would be, do you think this is a uh, necessary conditions for workers to have greater agency in order to, to tackle the way production is faced? Or do you think there's also a possibility for this through international cooperation, despite how uh, power dynamics play out in this globalized production? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A very good uh, question that I have no easy answer on. But I mean, obviously, the the EU is trying uh, to do this, and there um, is a lot of <coughs> maybe um, I start from a different angle. I think I'm not sure if the, the current strategies at the EU level would make uh, such a difference for Austria, for example, because at the moment the uh, reshoring initiatives are very much led by incumbent firms in the EU, so the, the, big, um, the big automotive companies in Europe that come from Germany but also from uh, France uh, should lead the transition and should for example in the in the context of e-mobility so there should be an uh, European value chains for uh, batteries and that should be led by um, incumbent firms in the EU. So I think that would not really change a lot for Austria or also for Eastern European countries, for example, because it's just, well, it's, uh, they follow uh, whatever Germany uh, is doing in a way. Yeah? So I'm not so sure if that would really um, 
change a lot. At the same time, I mean, I think it's uh, it's necessary to to do some kind of deglobalization in a way <laughs> to to structure the the industry <coughs> differently. At the same time. I think current strategies are very much focused, are very, um, we say chauvinistic uh, in a way, because uh, it's very much how can we make sure that uh, workers and citizens in Europe uh, can benefit from the transition. For example, when you talk about um, the, the relocation or the, the actual introduction of a European supply chain on batteries, it then also means that producers of lithium uh, in uh, the, the South American Triangle are not meant to be industrial producers in the process, you know, because that's something uh, where the, the industrial process is something that Europe wants to do. So I think there is, uh, yeah, it's not such an easy answer, I think, if some form of deglobalization that is necessary will really benefit or be made in such a way that it's really to, to the benefit of workers. Okay. My name is Akhror, Central Asia from Tajikistan. So um, I, qu I have actually two questions, but you partly answered the first one. But anyway, I'm going to ask that one. So how do international supply chain disruption? Because you already mentioned Russia, that you are importing some inputs from Russia and etc. And uh, so how does this international supply chain disruption and geopolitical factors affect Austria's automotive automotive sector and how is the country responding to these challenges regarding employment and sustainability and uh, and the second one would be how does Austria prepare for the impact of autonomous and connected vehicles on job and environment in its automotive industry mm. so these are two questions Yeah, I mean, these are really good questions, but I cannot really give a qualified <laughs> answer to this because, first of all, the, the, the whole aspect of disruption of supply chains was not really an issue when we did the interviews because this was 2019 and the disruptions mainly came with uh, the COVID-19 crisis and then afterwards uh, the the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I'm, I'm not, cannot really say uh, a lot on this actually. And but I mean, I from my from the my feeling would be that at the moment mm, these. I mean, the, the automotive industry doesn't seem to, in, in Austria, doesn't seem to feel that there are any changes necessary. Because what, um, I, I, I think there was some kind of um, movement um, in the, in the, um, at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, when it became so obvious that this uh, just-in-time production just doesn't really work, and there was a lot of discussion, well, we really need to to change these these structures, and then there was the the um, uh, ban of the ICE technology at the EU level, yeah, which is actually a a huge step, and then. <laughs> And now everything actually is still uh, is again questioned, and the the, the resistance against the ban mainly came came from Germany, but Austria was very quick uh, to say, well, we also we 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 are a car nation. Uh, our uh, chancellor said so. Actually, it's it's a very um, uh, 
quick move back uh, to say, well, actually, we would like that everything stays the same as it was. And I do not see, I do not see that there is a, a certain plan, also not for automation. I mean, maybe there is somewhere, but uh, <laughs> there is nothing really public, I would say. Yeah. Um, Hello, uh, thank you for presentation. I'm uh, Ivana from Montenegro, and uh, at the very beginning, you present how and pointed out how important is this industry for uh, Austria. And I'm really aware of risk, but I would like to uh, hear your opinion on uh, how uh, vulnerable uh, Austria is from this perspective, especially comparing to developing country. Because, like, I can imagine that, like, from perspective of uh, social. Uh, uh, like social protection is much in favor of uh, Austria than developing country and also as you pointed out about research I think that uh, I mean I saw that the green uh, green comp uh, green uh, potential complexity I think that's the name of think Peter <coughs> it's much higher in, in uh, Austria than other developing countries so I would like to hear your opinion on it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you mean if Austria is vulnerable because the industry is so important for yeah the whole for perspective first uh, for jobs like because uh, social social protection is in much better position than like uh, yeah. other developing country yeah. I yeah. mean losing job in Austria is not the same as losing yeah. job in yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean I, I think that that's an important point and I, I think that's really something that is is different in Austria compared to other supplier industries. We had some collaboration with, uh, with researchers doing similar um, research in, in the Czech Republic and in Hungary, uh, in Slovenia, for example. Uh, and there it's really different because the, the workers in these industry are not that, it's not skilled labor, but it's mainly unskilled. Uh, labor. So that's a difference in Austria and that's also a chance uh, probably because mm, the, um, the automotive industry is the one that actually sets the basically sets the, the wage uh, sets the wages. They're always the first uh, to in wage negotiations. So they and there is a high level of of um, also the the education system is, is specific in in Austria I think compared to other other countries there is a high I don't know how you would how you would call this in English, something like an apprenticeship uh, programs so it's really yeah, mm, mm, mm. so there is it, this is not kind of a, a school or a university level, but you have a combined system, a dual uh, education system where you uh, learn a certain profession and, and at the same time go to school. So this is very important in the, the industrial sectors. So, and as I, as I said, this then means that these workers usually do not have a problem in finding uh, another job. Of course, one problem is, mm, is of course, uh, like mobility, you know, mobility of, of, of workforce, because it's not, I mean, the, the government would say, well, it's, it's easy, you can, with your qualification, you can easily uh, find another job, but this job might be uh, three hours away from <laughs> where you live and have a family. And so I think that, therefore, it's not so easy to just say, well, uh, you can find another job, uh, but very often, job is not only something that you, I mean, maybe you don't care what you produce, but maybe you care where you produce it. <laughs> so that's a thing that is important, but as you, you're definitely right that from a, mm, from a, a social perspective, it's not comparable to, uh, it's not comparable to job losses in, in other countries, for example. Yeah, and usually there are also good, uh, 
retraining uh, programs. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise I have one or two questions myself. So may maybe I ask one or two questions and if, if there is another one, let me know. Um, I mean, in, in France, we have an issue with the nuclear industry. I mean, and, and uh, this is not a matter of uh, job losses because we know that for dismantling big uh, nuclear plants, we need many jobs and we need almost the same jobs. So people may stay for 20 or 30 years just dismantling those, uh, those, this industry. Uh, despite that, we, we still have a very big resistance from workers mm -hmm. to uh, go in that direction. So uh, maybe you have some reflections about that. Mm -hmm. Second thing, we, we, we also experience in France a growing <laughs> resistance of uh, mm -hmm. newly uh, trained engineers uh, that do not want to work for a big fossil fuel industry, big, I mean, they don't want to, to work in greenwashing. I don't say all of them do not want, but we have uh, some statements, some positions publicly taken by newly, uh, I mean, for the graduation ceremony, we had very ex excellent examples of, of students just graduating and during the ceremony saying that, okay, we, we had a bad, uh, bad training, not, exp I mean, everything about that. And then they don't want to go and work for Total for, for this very big industry. So do you have something similar in Austria or is it uh, something, I mean, which is growing here, but uh, and, and the third thing maybe is about, uh, I mean, in the automotive industry, there is not, I mean, about job losses, there is not only the environmental issue, there is also the development of new technologies in the way we produce uh, cars, especially this Industry 4.0 thing, which is probably threatening more uh, jobs than and workers than uh, than environmental mm -hmm. transformations. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let me know if you have other questions. Mm -hmm. There will be one then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, this is really interesting. The, the engineer thing. I I haven't heard about a similar thing, but I. Will. <laughs> I we are the forefront uh, of I, the. Yeah. I revolution. will. Uh, listen. Maybe we should uh, initiate uh, this. This as well. I mean, I I had a. A master student who was looking into um, especially education for the automotive industry. So mm -hmm. she actually looked at the university uh, courses and basically everything uh, that, that sources uh, the the automotive industry there she could not find something like that but uh, maybe uh, things have changed uh, since then so i think that would be really interesting but i don't know of any any similar things mm. maybe austria is more conservative i don't know yeah that's, <laughs> that's definitely uh, the case yes uh, i would uh, say this but um, it's it's Interesting. What we can observe is I'm, I'm at the uh, University of Natural Resource and Life Sciences, which is really a very conservative uh, university. You know? So that's actually basically the uh, agriculture and forest lobby that that is trained there. Um, and there we can, uh, and also a lot of engineering. You know, that um, and. We just uh, initiated a new master program, and there is a lot of interest uh, on this. So a lot of uh, people saying, "Well, we would like to hear more about um, structural um, system, why problems, so why uh, things are not changing, and not only develop technologies for uh, whatever." So I think there is. Uh, uh, there is a lot of interest, but I haven't uh, seen any specific uh, initiatives like the one you just mentioned. And I mean, on the nuclear industry, I, I can't actually say anything. The, the, the situation in Austria is really very different because there was this very historical decision in the 1970s uh, to not build the the, the mm. first nuclear power plant. And this was, uh, by the way, also very important uh, 
dividing line between the labor and the environmental movement because the, the unions back then were very much um, for uh, the, um, the, the power plant. It was actually also already built, so it now it is built, <laughs> but it never uh, went into operation and uh, there, are, you can, there are festivals there, which is actually quite nice. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and the, 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 it was a very important um, a point or, or moment in time for the environmental movement. So that's also one of the aspects actually why it is so difficult to, to link these movements because of this historical uh, Thing actually that uh, unions were very much uh, for for this but since then there is a, a, a kind of really a national consensus on anti-nuclear energy and I think this is something I I cannot imagine any other topic where there's actually such a unity which is uh, quite, a, quite interesting um, so yeah I mean I guess when you when you actually wanting to hear is that it's not only or obviously it's the although mm, I presented kind of these these uh, worker statements in a very positive way so there are uh, entry points for transformative change it's nevertheless and I hope this was clear yeah, it, it's it's difficult uh, because of course uh, Although if, if workers say, well, um, it's not so, so important what we produce, nevertheless, they have kind of, they, they've worked for certain companies for decades. Uh, and not only they, but also uh, their, their families have worked for, for these companies. So this is not, not nothing. I mean, that's uh, definitely the case. But as I said, it's in a way also some kind of intervention in the discourse to say we could, uh, we, there are entry points, we could take a closer look at where to, to go from here. Not that there is, so I'm not expecting um, a workers' lab transformation next Monday. <laughs> okay. Yes. My name is Tobias uh, from Austria. Um, I have two quick questions. First, because you said you did the work in order to bring the unions on the side of the ecological transition. Do you see the institutional setting in Austria, the Sozialpartnerschaft and so on, as a more as a problem in order to do a transition to shift like the work or more also as an advantage if they would be on the same side. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is in terms of your research, how do you see you interviewed like the representatives? But like as far as I knew, know in general, the participation in the elections is going always every every some years a little bit down again. How do you see this? You mean the elections for, for, the, for the chamber? Of yeah, for the chamber of labor, yeah. 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 If you see a role in this, or if you think that's not too big of a matter. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, maybe for, for all the others. So as I said, there is a mandatory membership in the Chamber of Labor if you are a worker in Austria. And then there are elections uh, for this Chamber of Labor. Uh, and the, the so not a, not a lot of people uh, participate uh, in this. So I, I'm not sure if there is really a, I mean, there are many reasons uh, why this is the case. Uh, one is definitely that it's increasingly difficult for, for the Chamber of Labor to to really mobilize uh, the workforce because it's uh, not, 
yeah, there is a lot of un, unorganized uh, workforce. Uh, there's not, uh, it's not the case that you say to the, go to the 10 biggest companies in Austria and then you have a certain percentage of it. So that's definitely a problem, but I'm not sure if this is really uh, so important. The, the, the institutional setup, I think this is, important. I mean, on the one hand, it's definitely a barrier. I mean, the, the social partnership is um, for, has been really difficult for environmental and uh, climate policies. And there is also some research that it is really a barrier. On the other hand, I the, it's not really strong anymore, and this does not have to do with, uh, with does not have to do with labor organizing, but it has mainly to do with the business side. So actually, the um, the business organizations do not really uh, care a lot anymore about the social partnership. So they just uh, do their thing, and maybe this is actually an opportunity <laughs> for also for the environmental movement and the labor movement to join forces. I mean, it's not the, the best historical moment in time, but it's maybe an opportunity because this, these times will not come back. So there won't be uh, this, uh, prosperous uh, time after the Second World War where everyone sits together on the table to decide what, uh, how, to, how to share the cake uh, equally. So that's maybe a possibility to also for, for the, the labor movement to see that this is, yeah, maybe it's a better idea to, to join forces with, with the environment. Thank you. Any other question? <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> Melanie. <laughs>